All right, we'll wait a few seconds. I'll play a little bit of something in the background. I've learned my lesson from previous webinars. Awesome. Yeah, so as much conversational as possible, I think that's that's that would make me feel. Um, Absolutely, people are, are filing in right now. And what's your time estimate for this, Anthony? We have about an hour. Got it. Yeah, so that's gonna, I definitely need some, I need some, in order to fill an hour, I think they've got about 30, 35 minutes of sort of talking space here. Okay. So I'm letting people file in and I'm going to figure out how to add me as a, um, a panelist that I pop up with you as well. Oh yeah, that'd be that'd be great. As the host, I can't be panelist. That's all right. All right, we'll wait, wait about another minute and let folks file in. Put my phone on mute. There we go. Very glad to be here. Thanks for the invite. Absolutely, Avery. That is a potential cut. That's our one of our customers. <laughs> All right, we are going to go ahead and get started. All right, everybody, welcome to uh, our webinar series. We've done, I want to say this is about our sixth webinar in the past couple months. Um, we're very lucky to, to have Brian Anderson come and speak to you guys. Uh, just a quick background on Winston Engineering. Um, we have been working on cannabis facilities providing uh, HVAC electrical um, plumbing, fire alarm, alternative energy, such as battery backup. Um, we're really passionate about sustainability, um, which is why we have the sustainability series. I think it's something that's extremely important and not enough people talk about it in cannabis because uh, a lot of times it seems like a money grab and, and that's not what this should be about. As more and more states come on board, um, we're gonna, they're gonna consume a lot of power. So sustainability, um, is, is a really big deal. Um, as you know, we have Brian Anderson from uh, Anderson Porter Design coming to speak to you guys about the top five must haves for indoor air quality. Um, so I am going to pass it along to Brian and then I'm also gonna screen share the, uh, the website you told me about. Oh, sure. Awesome. Hey, Anthony. Yeah. Hi, participants. Uh, glad to be here. Um, yeah, this is awesome. So top five, uh, top five must haves for better IAQ or indoor air quality um, is uh, actually Anthony, it's, it's a different, uh, that's a different one you're showing there. But if you, uh, it's a separate top, that was a different blog post, but if you want to, uh, it's actually, that was the systematic approach to sustainability. There's another one called top five. Um, so indoor air quality. So that's what, um, let's get it up on the screen. 
Uh, it should be around March. There we go. There you go. Awesome. Um, April 29, yeah. So um, folks can find this on, on SCC, the Sustainable Cannabis Coalition website. Um, I'm a member of that and it was published back in April. Uh, but I think it's a really relevant topic. I don't think this is old news. Um, indoor air quality is fundamental both. And you know, it's why I appreciate Anthony you know, hosting this because he's a mechanical engineer, right? So it, much of what I'm talking about here is, is sort of shared, is shared knowledge between architects and, and engineer or shared responsibility. Um, because, you know, plant health and, and human health are the, two, are the two things we're focused on. Typically, you know, architects tend to only be focused on human health and they sort of, you know, just put the blinders on and march through and say, well, make sure the door width is correct make sure the you know the egress is right uh and it's you know it's 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 all those items for human health but we want to focus here today on plant health and so the indoor air quality we're really focused on is what matters to the plant yeah and i think that's a mistake we made so um we have licensed mechanical engineers i myself am electrical and one of our very first cultivation projects we treated the cultivation facility as though it was a normal building, right? And the architect, I'm sorry, the, the grower came back and said, what are you guys doing? We don't need, I think we put 20 tons in a room. We, he's like, we've been growing for 20 years. We only need five tons. And so we really had to change our mindset on relying on the growers and the experts in the actual plant um, in terms of, of HVAC. And, uh, you know, that, that's an excellent point that so I started in this industry in 2014. Uh, Ma Massachusetts uh, had uh, medical legalized in 2012 uh, and we legalized adult use in 2018. And so 2014 folks were, you know, knowledge was really coming out of uh, California um, uh, from Humboldt and it was coming out of Colorado uh, for indoor grows. And many times in Colorado, the, the attitude was you build four walls and you just extend them up to the seat, to the underside of the ceiling <clears throat> and the existing structure. When you walk into a grow room and you look up over your head, it was perfectly acceptable in those days to see the, to see the roof, right? To see wow. trusses running by and to see the roof. <clears throat> and so there's my first point. If you scroll down just to just to uh, click there, Anthony, is I want to, what, what is the top five? What is my number one on the top five for indoor air quality is build a box in a box. Uh, both boxes matter, right? So the exterior box that I'm talking about is your shell. That is your envelope. That's the real estate you start with. And it needs to be tight, absolutely. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it needs to be relatively tight. Um, Right in California, you need to pass the energy code. Uh, in most states now, in the United States, you have an energy code, and that building, that envelope, that outer box, has to conform with the energy code. The inner box is the one that we need to make conform for the plant. So the plant health is now based on that inner box, and it should have a box. Remember, a box has six sides. Right? It's got a roof, four walls, and it's got a floor, and all of those matter. Um, so it's the, so if you're, you're, you're building, you know, the building department, your, 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 your authorities having jurisdiction are going to be asking you questions about that outer envelope, right? Is it, is it weather resistant? Is it, is it thermally, uh, uh, um, compliant to meet the national and state energy codes? The inner box, the, the authority having jurisdiction doesn't really care about. It. We care about it. The plant is what cares about it. So we, um, typically build these out of metal panel, insulated metal panels, because they go up quick, they have fewer joints, uh, they don't have, they're not cavity walls, right? They're solid core. They don't have cavities in the center of the wall. So we really like insulated metal panels and uh, we're building five sides, four walls and a roof or ceiling out of all the same material. And um, you, no wood anywhere. Don't even use a wood plate on the floor, use a metal plate and, and, and caulk it tightly and seam it. And if you're using an epoxy floor, have that epoxy floor uh, weld up to the, uh, to the side. So you have a very, very watertight, airtight 
inner box. So that's the idea of the box within the box. You got an envelope, make sure it's compliant with the state codes, build an inner box. Uh, and I've got some numbers here. You see the um, 0 0.5 ACH at 50 PA. What that means is you put a blower door test on your door once you get a door in this metal panel room and you test it with a negative pressure. So PA is Pascal's pressure is measured, measured in Pascal's. Anthony, I'm venturing into your territory as an engineer here, uh, you know, talking about this stuff, but 50 ACH is air changes per hour, excuse me, 0.5 air changes per hour. So that's how tight, that's a designation of, of air tightness. And that matters to your mechanical engineer. Mechanical engineer wants to know about in, infiltration and exfiltration. They want to know how tight is the room that we're conditioning. Now, that, in the field, who's responsible for doing these tests? And I'm asking this for the for the uh, the, the participants. Is it do you hire some third party, or is it the HVAC technician that installs it? It's no, no, neither. In fact, it's the it's the metal panel contractor. So we put the note, we put that, so we work closely on every job with, the, with engineers, right? That's not a distant, you know, relationship. That's a very close, tight relationship. So we're putting these types of specifications onto our drawings as architects. We're reviewing them with the engineers. So the, so the, so the mechanical engineer understands the parameters of the room that they're heating and cooling. And then the contractor who gets the contract to install it, the, you know, the metal panel contractor, is the one and the general contractor is the one who enforces it. So the general contractor has to know and understand what that, what that note means. And they have to require as a condition of satisfaction that the metal panel installer be responsible, not just to put up the panels, but then to test the room, this is commissioning. So really what, I'm, what your question goes to is who, can, who does it and then who commissions it. So the metal panel installer must understand that there are criteria for the performance criteria, and then it has to get commissioned. And usually it's an, it's in, in, in my experience, it's been the mechanical engineer who has the equipment. Typically mechanical engineers who do residential work, if you're familiar with HERS rating, home energy rating services in the, uh, in the net zero world of uh, home building, um, a blower door test is what is what we're talking about. And you can do the blower door, usually you can do this once and then the panel installer gets it, right? You don't, they don't have to do it on every room. You do it once, everybody understands how, what the performance criteria are and then they, and then they knock it out uh, in short order. Okay, thank you. And for everybody who's, who's on, uh, feel free to put your questions in the Q and A. We'll make this as interactive as we possibly can. Awesome. Um, I see somebody asking about heat welded vinyl covering the wall. Um, I'm not sure how that, I'm not sure whether there's a question there or whether that's a, um, um, if you want to resend that um, as a question, I'd be happy to address it. Wasn't quite sure how to, how to address heat welded vinyl on walls. Um, so number two, uh, second, <laughs> you know, uh, David Letterman here, number two. Um, out of the way is um, ceilings and floors, right? So I touched on this already, right? A box has six sides. So don't forget about the ceiling and don't forget about the floor. So the ceilings we like um, to have in the same material, insulated metal panels. Obviously there's structural implications there. You have to be able to span the room size uh, and that might mean additional structure to carry those panels so they don't you know, fall under the weight of your lights. If you're on a single tier grow, you probably have your lights hung from a unistrut grid right? That unistrut grid has to attach to something. Um, you, if you're growing on tiered grows, you know, your lights are attached to tiers, but you still have stuff hanging from the ceilings. So you've got to structurally support the ceilings. The floors, epoxy, uh, look for a good cove base that rolls up the, uh, that rolls up the edges because, you know, I don't think I've been in a grow room yet that hasn't experienced a spill event, right? Um, something happens to that, uh, something happens to that uh, you know, something spills and fertigation line lets go and you've got water flooding the floor. So you don't want that water flooding underneath the floor connection of the wall to the floor. That's vitally important. It's on us as the MEP engineers to provide adequate drainage, whether that's a trench drain or just drain holes throughout to make sure that that water doesn't leave that room other than the drain. 
That's right. You think about microbial contamination, think about what are, the, what are the risk factors here, right? Microbial contamination moves from one room to the next. If water moves underneath that floor, underneath the wall to floor uh, joint, you know, that next room, let's hope that next room is not your dry room, right? <laughs> let's not put a dry room against a grow room and have a flood event in the grow room. And now you've, you know, you've, re, you've rehydrated your, your most valuable product. Um, so, so that's the idea. Don't forget about the floors. Don't forget about the ceilings. The, you know, all six sides of that box are, uh, are vitally important. What else have I got in there? Don't leave exposed concrete on the floor. Just, you know, don't, you know, don't try to anticipate these things as vital to your grow operation and not as surprise costs at the end of the job, right? You should anticipate that there's going to be epoxy floor on your entire cultivated area. You should anticipate there will be ceilings over every room that has uh, that has a uh, has growing plants in it. You should have you should have ceilings in your corridors as well for proper cascading airflow. We'll get to that on number four. Um, but don't forget about floors and ceilings. Uh, slip resistant floors, cleanable. As we move toward GMP, good manufacturing practices, uh, you want to be able to wash down these rooms uh, with a mild salt, you know, with a mild detergent. And as Anthony said, you want to have a floor drain on the floor to be able to push that through um, to get it out. And then with the flooring, it, it also matters what color you paint it as well, right? I haven't experienced much. Are you talking about reflectivity? Are you talking about light reflectivity? Light re reflectivity, correct. I haven't really, I don't, I'm not an authority on this. I, I have, um, heard anecdotes about, you know, about um, light reflectivity of the walls, right, aiding to, you know, aiding to the canopy, uh, but I haven't heard much about the floor. Because um, mm. I've heard some, some, some reports of making sure that you pick the correct colors for walls and floors, because that reflectivity, the reflectivity can negatively impact your plants. Um, and that's something I want to dig into, because that may be a good, another good topic to talk talk about? Um, number three, quarantine. Um, you know, I, I mentioned this here in the, in the blog, but prior to COVID, um, we did not have a good shared understanding, at least from my firm and our customers, we did not have a universally shared understanding of what quarantine meant. But um, we, Massachusetts is, a, is controlled by 25B. Uh, which is which disallows anything on a 25 not on a 25b list cannot be used in a grow environment which means you cannot use pesticides or herbicides in the commonwealth of massachusetts that's a significant statement if you're, if you're growing cannabis and you want to have a uh, good um you don't want to have you know problems arise right so how do you keep problems so it's again it's it's slightly different from the standard notion of indoor air quality but what I'm getting at here is that we don't want to let anything into your facility that could negatively impact the plants. So, you know, how did the, you know, how did the, how did the longhorn beetle get into the United States from China? It came burrowed into the wood of a shipping crate, right? So think of that, think of that pallet that comes into your, into your grow room, uh, excuse me, the pallet that comes into your shipping and receiving bay. You know, what do you do? Do you just open the door from shipping and receiving and then haul it right directly into your grow room, that's, that would be a lack of quarantine, right? So quarantine mm -hmm. would be an intermediate step. You can receive things in your shipping bag. You wanna unwrap them and push everything that doesn't belong in your facility back out the door, the plastic, the pallet, anything, right? That might contain somebody else's problem that you don't wanna make your problem. Now move whatever, you're, whatever consumable you're, you're bringing in from the outside, move it into a, into a quarantine room. And we uh, reference here this Kansas State uh, entomology paper. And you can, uh, if you go to this blog, you can, you can get a link uh, that shows what temperature will kill um, soft-bodied um, pests. And it's 62 degrees Celsius, or about 143.6 Fahrenheit. So we use the same insulated metal panels in a quarantine room, and we put a sauna heater in there, and we heat the room up to about 150 degrees for an hour. And we're killing everything that could possibly in negatively impact your plants. So it's a slightly different take on indoor air quality here, but it goes to overall plant health, uh, especially in states where you cannot use pesticides and herbicides. 
you want to very diligently make sure that nothing that doesn't belong in your facility has a way finds its way in. Yeah, I recently had a client in the high desert. He was building, you know, metal tilt up building. And I noticed that his grow rooms, the access was directly from outside. And, you know, I'm an MEP engineer, but I do know a little bit about uh, grow room flow. And the first thing I asked him, I said, you sure you don't want to add a hallway um, to access those rooms? Because the worst thing that you want is to have some pests and come into your, your facility and then they multiply and then you lose a whole crop. Precisely. That is precisely the issue. So you need, so not only should a corridor, and I may get to this, not only should a corridor separate or a quarantine room separate your, your, your uh, materials intake from your actual grow environment, there should be airlocks at the end of any corridor to prevent staff from just sticking a wood block in a door and leaving it open, right? You never want to have somebody prop a door open in a harvest corridor letting air, outside air, come in and just filter down through your, through your environment. So uh, here's a good, yeah, so here it is. Number four, top, top five um, must-haves is number four, create a detailed plan with, with the engineering team for a cascading airflow. So cascading airflow, this, this is specifically GMP language. So this is good manufacturing practices. Cascading air effects, uh, I learned this from drug manufacturing, from FDA standards. So the idea, just like water cascades from a high to a low, air will do the same thing. So you wanna specify that your grow rooms have a positive pressure. You get positive pressure in the grow room by adding cubic feet per minute, CFM. So you want two to 300, usually 250 CFM of outside air is pushed into your grow room so that it stays positively pressured. Now, Hopefully, as Anthony said, there isn't some big roll-up door with gaps in it <laughs> to the high desert where the air is leaking out, right? You've got what I, what I was asking for in the first one, which is a tightly, air, tightly sealed room with no big roll-up doors connecting it to the outside. And you have your air then cascades out through the one point that is, that is vulnerable, right? Which is your entry door in and out of the room. Maybe you use a double door, that's fine, but a double door doesn't have, a, it doesn't have an asterisk down the center, so that's a place for air to leak out. Uh, and every time you open and close the door, air leaks out, we get it. Air's gonna leak out, that's fine. So you've got a high pressure room, so that every time you open that door, you get a little bit of assist. You know, anytime you walk into a room that's pressurized, you feel if you're pushing the door in, it's a little hard to open it. If you're pulling the door out, it's very easy to open it because there's high pressure. Now, so, have you ever seen, you've, been inside a lot more facilities than, than I have, but, and, and I'm thinking of this because I just saw the movie again, Outbreak, where they have their contaminants in one room, but before they get into there, there's like a, a room that you have to go into, and then they go in there and they kind of spray themselves off. Yeah. Are, are you seeing that level of um, sanitation in grow rooms? So thank you. Yes, airlocks. So uh, we talked about quarantine as a kind of buffer, right, between your between your shipping and receiving and your and your let's call it your your work corridor that links you to your rooms, right? So you understand that you understand that quarantine room as a kind of buffer, right? Adjacent to the quarantine room, we put an airlock so that staff moving from the shipping and receiving bay into that same, call it your, your transplant corridor, your harvest corridor, whatever you call that corridor that links all of your grow rooms and your, and your moms and your, and your bedrooms, you wanna have an airlock. And that airlock has a negative pressure. On the other end, you have employees and staff coming in out of, a, out of your grow, right? From the business end of your facility, right? Let's say you have an employee entrance. It's not the shipping bay, right? There's an employee entrance. Employees should move in to a, um, through a uh, changing facility and a gowning room, right? So the gowning room, again, is slightly negatively pressured. So you've got the positive pressure in the, in the flower room, neutral pressure, let's say, in the corridor, and a negative pressure in an airlock. And a, and a, and a gowning room would, would count as an airlock, right? You come in from the restroom area, you come in from the business unit, you come into a gowning room, you sit down, you pull on the booties, or you put on your factory-issued footwear, right? You put on a jacket, you go through a boot wash, you go through a hand wash, and you enter that, you enter that clean corridor, your harvest corridor, your transplant corridor, your, your work corridor. Um, so you now have really 
um, created a way when you're, so your employees are not carrying pests in from the outside that are gonna impact your plants. And the cascading airflow um, is, how we, is how we do that from a ventilation perspective. There's a link there if you go, if anybody wants to go and click on that link, the WHO is the World Health Organization. So, um, oops, the link has been severed. Uh, but if you go to the World Health Organization, you can find a report, there's, I, I numbered it. So there's report number 961 from 2011. Um, look it up, right? And so this is standard operating procedures in pharma in drug manufacturing. So um, we're just reaching out to other industries and bringing, bringing standards from other industries into the, into the cannabis space. Question, can you have um, too much airflow within a room, a grow room? So- Beyond damaging the plants, of course. Yeah, so, so there's a lot going on in a grow room. Um, the methods that we, employ whether it's a I don't want to get into this seminar to talk about mechanical systems but the primary function of the mechanical system in my mind is it should pull the total air out of the room how many times Anthony what's the what's the air change per hour of a system of your design is it is it 15 times an hour is it 30 times an hour what's the what's the airflow exchange uh, grow room is it six I, I, I'm not I, an engineer it's about six to time, six to ten times. Uh, sometimes, sometimes that number is dictated by the growers as well. So imagine your total air volume is pulled out through your mechanical system, and your mechanical system is going to vary depending on where you are in the country. High desert versus, you know, humid Florida or humid Michigan. Right? You need to check, select the right system. But what it should do is it should pull all the air out of your grow room a certain rate, and that air should flow through a. Um, there should be cleansing techniques in that mechanical system, right? There should be either ozone or uh, there's ways in which you purify that air before you put, you, not only do you cool it properly and, and dehumidify that air, but you also want to, um, you know, bug zap it essentially. You wanna pull biocontaminants out of that air. And typically that's either done through an ozone filter or through other types of filters. So that's your primary function going on with your mechanical system and your dehu system. Then growers will install and call for other types of horizontal airflow, HAF fans or vertical airflow, VAF fans, uh, absolutely, to agitate the plant, to move the air around in the space. But primarily the air is, if you're changing air in a room six times and the room has got how many cubic feet? It's, let's say it's 2,500 square foot room, how many, you know, at 10 feet tall, that's 25,000 cubic feet of air, right? So that's six times an hour, that's a fast moving, that air is moving fast in there. You know, these facilities, they're loud, right? Yeah, it's funny, I, I, I grow vegetables and I had a larger property at one point and I got tired of rabbits and stuff getting into it. So I covered it with a plastic sheath with a PVC you know, lining. And I'm wondering like, why are my plants dying? And it's like, duh, because I don't have any airflow whatsoever. <laughs> Learning the hard way. So um, yeah, check out the World Health uh, Report. Apologize for any broken links in there, but it's uh, Technical Report Series 961 from the World Health Organization has really good understanding uh, for a deeper dive uh, into, um, into uh, case cascading air effects. Um, I see Avery Bash, hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, has a question. Avery, is there a way to affordably add GMP and other um, national and international standards to be prepared for federal legalization without adding huge costs? Uh, yes and no. Absolutely, Avery. Uh, there are um, two types of preparations for any facility to be GMP compliant for WHO or, or EU GMP or Health Canada compliant. And I would say three quarters of those are operational, meaning OPEX costs, right? SOPs, things that your employees need to do. About a quarter of them are CAPEX costs, things you need to bake in, build in to your facility from a design perspective. So of, the, of, the, of all the things you can do to be uh, internationally or nationally compliant for future FDA certification or validation, um, think of it as the 
biggest bulk of stuff you can do is OPEX. It's your employees and their standard operating procedures or SSOP, sanitary standard operating procedures. But there are physical things and literally cascading airflows. The reason I talk about it is because that is one of the items of preparation for GMP. So you, you know, the, the question of will it add costs? Well, sure, it adds, adds costs, but keep in mind when I said at the top of the call, you know, folks in Colorado sometimes don't even put a ceiling in a room. Well, what does that cost you, right? Think about the, think about the downtime, right? What is, the, what is the cost of downtime uh, of losing a crop, right? It eclipses the added cost of ceilings or it eclipses the added cost of, let's say, um, providing a gasket around a door, right? Or, or doing, a, doing a blower door test on a door. I think these costs um, pencil out when you look at them from a, uh, I hope that helps. But yeah, there's, there's a whole bunch of these things when it comes to food. I think much of what we're talking about here in this webinar today is, is plant, is plant focused. So, you know, we could do a whole nother thing on food, food preparation, food facilities, because the FDA has a lot to say about that, about food manufacturing as well. So um, uh, other types of ingestibles, obviously cannabis is an ingestible. So we're trying to keep the plant as healthy as we can. Um, number five, okay, we're coming up on, uh, yeah, just crossed the sort of halfway, halfway point here, but um, this is a great discussion. So CO2 matters, um, right? We do <clears throat> enriched environments in, in, uh, in both in, in, in leafy greens and in cannabis, right? You can't grow a plant without the right daily light index of, of, of photons. You can't grow it without CO2 um, and you can't grow it without water. So once you get those things in balance, um, the, then your local authority having jurisdiction steps in and says, hey, they blow a whistle and say, well, you've got CO2 in here. And again, we wanna focus on plant health and not forget about your employee's health, right? None of this is at the expense of your employee's health, but look at it this way. Your grower as, you know, day in, day out, Grow specialists give me the targets of 1,200 to 1,500 ppm of CO2 for an enriched environment. Building code says 5,000 ppm is, 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 is dangerous to human health, right? So how do you get from 1,500 to 5,000? Nobody wants 5,000 you know, parts per million of you know, CO2 in their room. A, you can't afford it, and B, you're going to kill your employees. So how do we avoid that? Really easily. Many jurisdictions or many engineers I see, I challenge, and Anthony, I'm open to pushback here on this one, but I see a common response from mechanical engineering of putting in a, a CO2 evacuation system in a, in a grow room. So a CO2 evac system for folks on this call or for Anthony is a, basically it's a giant vent in the, in the roof, right up through the roof from your grow room directly out to your roof. And it's got a fan in it and it's got a filter and it says that if that alarm goes off, that your entire air, remember we're talking about the air is changing six times per hour, right? Anyway, six to 10 times per hour, anyway. This is in addition to that, an event goes off, you're gonna dump all of the air of that grow room out into the atmosphere. That's what a evacuation system is designed to do. You are exactly spot on and we do it on every facility that we work on. Um, we've, we've gotten pushbacks from, pushback from contractors who the clients have hired because they want to save a little bit of money on installation and i'm like i don't care what the ahj says or what they require at a minimum we require it as an engineering firm because as licensed professionals um human safety always comes first first awesome so we have we have a real debate here so anthony this is anthony winston versus brian anderson <laughs> See how this one goes. I'm, I, <laughs> I'm glad we're on zoom and not and not in the same room <laughs> so noodle on this. I agree with you 100% that human life safety matters, human, human life safety matters over the plant. So imagine if we will, that if we set an alarm in the room, we have, a, we have a sensor in the room that is tied to a visual and audio, a visual, meaning a, a light flashing and an audible sensor in the room and outside the room, in the corridor outside the room. Okay, so now we have visual and audio, audible sensors inside and outside the room. So there's a light over the door and it's got, it'll blink if that room goes over 1500. Let's say it goes over, let's pick 2000 P 
ppm for a dangerous level. And if at 2000 ppm, that light goes off, or maybe it's 2,500, let's we'll agree on a number, right? What I'm, my claim is that there are only ever three to four gardeners in that room at a time, okay? So now we're talking about three to four persons that need to be safely evacuated. What is the amount of time that it takes those three to four gardeners to evacuate that room at 2,500 ppm of, of not 5,000 ppm here, but 2,500, right? Do we really want to have the entire room evacuated of air and dumped into the atmosphere in the time that those three employees could have walked out of the room? That's a good point. And, and I, I agree with that point. My thought is the, the much dangerous level, right? When he starts getting a over human safe where it's harmful at the 5,000 ppm, then I will argue that we need to exhaust all the, the air. But I, I think you're correct with the visual and audible. If you set a, a, a set point below that 5,000, that says, hey, get out the room. Um, and now then if, if it builds up, let's say there's a, a malfunction in the CO2 delivery system. Yes, you have fail safes. So now we're talking about control systems. So mm -hmm. here we get into how does this, how do the room sensors connect to control systems? And is, is there no fail safe control system that can cut the CO2 to the building? I, there's, there are fail safes that can cut CO2 to the, to, the, to the facility. So that if any one room, you can simply cut CO2 delivery out of the, because it's a tank outside, right? We're not yeah. talking more about, about wheeling carts, you know, wheelable, you know, people, you don't want to, so let me put that out there. Is, we don't design facilities where employees push CO2 tanks with a solenoid valve on them around through the corridors in a hand truck. Those days are past. CO2 is gonna be in a tank outside. You're gonna have a Praxair or a Nuco come and deliver that. They're gonna come on a monthly basis. They're gonna refill that tank. They own the tank, right? We own the bollards, we own the fence. And then we're, we own the distribution system to all of your rooms. So through control systems, we can put a fail safe cutoff switch Again, I'm outside of my jurisdiction here, Anthony. So, so you know, bunch back, but um, I'm just an architect um, and say that, um, so I have done this as a, the way I've, why I have some confidence here, Anthony, is I've written this up as a code compliance alternate. I fully understand what the code is requiring and why you do as you describe that you do, because that's what the code says has to happen. But I've written a code compliance alternate for authorities having jurisdiction to say that this is a reasonable alternate, code compliance alternate, that I as a professional and will protect safety, protect life safety. And I completely agree with you. I've, I've never heard it put that way, to be honest. So I just learned something, right? So this could be something that I can say to my clients in the future and say, hey, you can either have an exhaust system that'll exhaust all the air or a, uh, some type of signal that closes the valve on your CO2 delivery system. And now I'm wondering, do they have, and this is something out kind of for my homework, do they have HVAC companies who create these, let's say rooftop units that can be triggered to exhaust the, break the loop and exhaust the air out as well? So that brings up num uh, bullet board item number two underneath uh, this, no this number five the dump of enriched conditioned air out into the neighborhood. I call it neighborhood. If you're in the high desert, your neighbors are what? Coyotes and sage. <laughs> and cactus. I get it, I get it. I'm, I live in Massachusetts and, and I do a lot of work in Michigan. I do a lot of work in Massachusetts. And these facilities are very often in Massachusetts in someone's neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And we as architects work with our customers on the uh, permitting and the special permitting of facilities, sometimes for months it takes to negotiate the ability to put this facility next to a residential neighborhood. And one of the assurances that most municipalities, okay, we're not in Oklahoma here where you go straight to building department. Once you get your, <laughs> once you get your, your license in Oklahoma, you go straight to the building department. No one asks you about noise mitigation or odor mitigation. But in Massachusetts, in Michigan, these come up. So let's talk about odor mitigation in relative to a CO2 dump of, of air. You just passed your special permit from the you know, township in Michigan by telling them about the sophisticated system that's gonna control odor. And then, oh, oops, I forgot to tell you that if the CO2 goes over a certain limit, we're gonna dump all of that air out into the neighborhood. 
and it's going to be full of terpenes, terpenes, mm. VOCs, volatile organic compounds. People are going to smell that. There's no way to disguise that. Yeah. So I see that as a, when you bring that up to the planning board director, say, Mr. Planning Board Director, please tell the building commissioner to accept the code compliance alternate because you as a town don't want to smell that dump of air. I mean, if you're in Pasadena or in, in uh, name, a, name a coastal community where they raise cut flowers and they've got million square feet of greenhouse and they're converting that now all to cannabis. And those greenhouses are designed with root, you know, ridge vents. Mm -hmm. At night, instead of spending money on HVAC, they just dump humid they dump that humid air out into the into the into the into the atmosphere well what does it do everybody smells it that's a really good point, a really so, good point. we spent a lot of time with special permit getting getting our customers through hard fought battles with municipalities and most of those around noise and odor are their concerns. Oh, they're concerned about traffic and there's all, you know, all kinds of stigma that they think cannabis is going to ruin their neighborhood. But once we've convinced them that it's not, I don't want to start dumping. I don't want to propose that I'm going to dump air out at midnight someday because a CO2 level got up. And remember, it's three people or at midnight, there's nobody in that room. Yeah. Think of Anthony, when you're designing that system, you're adding a penetration in the roof, which can leak. Right. Every time you penetrate a roof with a system like that, you've got an opportunity for a leak. You're, you're displacing room area, floor space. Therefore, you're displacing canopy area to put that system in. So I only see that as a negative impact on a grow. I don't see it as a positive impact. So let's let's say for as an example, the room does get to five thousand. It's midnight. Nobody's in there, and we use the method of just cutting off the CO2 that excess CO2 is still there. Are you then saying that that excess CO2 will hopefully be exhausted through the, what did, what did you say, the 0.5 uh, ACH? ACH? So you're, now remember, you, you're, um, what is your air changes? What are your, what is your, does your primary mechanical system have the ability to pull that CO2 out? Will that CO2 dissipate naturally? That's a good question. There, there, there. I need an engineer to help me to understand um, further. Um, like, how do we? Let's say that malfunction happens at midnight or two a.m. when there's nobody in there. The alarms go off. The doors lock. You've got a, you know, you've got a, a, a full BAS here that where you've connected all of your sensors to your door access controls. So you know you can't go into the room if it's because it's dangerous, right? So. Does will that dissipate naturally over time? Um, That's more homework for me. Yep. <laughs> I but, see. Uh, Emily Long has a question for you. What would you recommend as far as technology type for microbial filtration to keep plants healthy, but also protect worker health in the grow rooms? You mentioned ozone filters, PCO, electrostatic ionization, bipolar ionization. Where's that question? Is that? It would be, it's in a and I'm not sure you have access to that as a panelist. Oh, is that, is that audio okay? So microbial filtration, what would you recommend to keep plants healthy, but also protect workers' health? Um, all, of the, all, of these, all of these items are in fact, my recommendations, all five of these top fives are what I are, I think we've just outlined. So um, the box within a box helps to control the air quality in that room. Um, making sure that you've, you've pro, you know, understand that you will have flood events, understand that people will leave a hose on, you know, and go to use the bathroom and forget about it. And you're gonna have water all over the floor. That's how your, that's how your microbial <clears throat> load uh, is put into danger, right? So, so because you now you've spilled water everywhere. So how do you prevent that? To uh, it's it's through you know a very good tight seal between your floor and your walls, right? That's not there's no wood in there. There's no wood studs on the floor that's used as the as the as the anchor for the for the wall. And that your and that your um, your floor covering has a good cove mold that rolls right up the uh, right up the first six inches of the wall, right? So there. I think all of these things that I've outlined, I hope, 
go to answer that question. And I would also say pay close attention to uh, your vent vents in the room because vents can be a breeding ground for uh, for microbes. So there are there are times where you can just have the vents that are blowing air into the room without actual ductwork. And then there are also some companies that make sleeves that you can put around your ductwork to help uh, reduce the amount of microbes that can you know, multiply within your ductwork. And that's why we recommend the ozone in the, in the primary unit, in the mechanical system. So during those six to 10 air changes, you're filtering that air, right? Uh, here's one that I didn't talk in depth about, but I'm happy that, that, that also goes to answer this question. It's why we recommend insulated metal panels as wall systems instead of cavity walls. So if everybody knows what a cavity wall is, it's a, it's a stud with a, with a sheathing applied over it, right? And so if you, if you look in the room that you're in and you see a, a, an outlet in the wall that's got a plug cover over it, right? That's, there's an air leakage, there's an air exchange between the room that you're in and that plug on the wall, whether it's a light switch or whether it's an outlet. What we recommend to avoid microbial contamination is don't use, don't build grow rooms with cavity walls. Build grow rooms with insulated metal panels and attach all of your electrical surface mounted. They're not cavity mounted anymore. It's a very different technique. This goes to that question that I think Avery asked about, you know, does this impact cost? Yes, it impacts cost, but it gives you an opportunity to clean everything and you avoid mold growing in places, cavities that you can't see. So you wanna protect worker health, general health and, and plant health. Don't build with cavity walls in spaces that contain plants. Build with solid filled um, insulated metal panels or some version of that. All right. Um, Let's see, do we have any other questions? I think that was it for questions. Cool. All right, well, I will, um, if, if that is all, I would definitely like to Thank you for your time. I know you're extremely busy. Um, and if you want to tell folks where, where, you, where you work, where you're licensed and that Just whole thing. Sure. So yeah, I'm an architect. Um, we established that. I'm about 27 years uh, in business as an architect. 20 of those was a general practice. Um, the past seven years, I've been focusing purely on, on the cannabis industry. So we design controlled environment horticulture, we design manufacturing facilities, we design packaging facilities, we've, we've done uh, canning facilities for drinks um, and retail stores. Uh, we're headquartered in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Uh, uh, on paper, I have an office in, in Fullerton, California. Uh, so we have a toehold in the, on the West Coast, but we're not, we're, not, um, we're out there to support, support a, a customer in Los Angeles who's totally wrapped around the axle and not moving forward very fast. So it's, uh, it's on hold, uh, but we practice all over the US. Uh, we support license applications. So if there's people out there in a competitive state that, are, that need um, you know, a, a floor plan you know, in, a, in a real estate, we do a lot of work like that. We do uh, direct design and construction work. We're not builders, we're architects, but we, you know, we're involved throughout the entire process. Uh, we're licensed in the New England states, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, Massachusetts, um, New Jersey, Michigan, Oklahoma, and Florida. Awesome. Uh, and we do work, however, as well in Illinois, um, Virginia, Georgia, uh, and, and all over the US. So, um, yeah, that's a bit about what where, where we come from, what we're doing. Awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for your time and everybody else's time. Uh, a few announcements. I will be speaking next Tuesday in Vegas at the Cannabis Business Conference, uh, Cannabis Business Times Conference uh, on facility design. And if anybody wants to catch, catch the new podcast that I did with Cannabis Business Times, it kind of gives you a kind of a preview uh, of, dis of the discussion, especially as it relates to existing warehouses and what you need to do um, when you're going to do cultivations within those facilities and what to look out for. Uh, there's the website up there. 
And then also for uh, previous webinars, and I'll upload this as well, I have a, 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 a YouTube channel, just look up Winston Engineering, and we have a, a playlist that's specific to uh, webinars that we've done. So tons of education, tons of uh, insight. So thank you all for attending and um, everyone have a good rest of your day. Thank you so much, Nancy. This was great. All right, you guys.